welcome back to the Tower of Bible podcast. I'm Dr. Bob Cargill, the excavator, and I'm here today with Jordan Jones, a graduate student here at the University of Iowa. Welcome. Thank you. And we are working on a topic that is of interest to everyone, seemingly perpetually, and that is what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Um, now, I know that you're going to roll your eyes and you're going to say, oh, God, we, we've, we've heard this, we've seen this uh, seemingly annually. Uh, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant, right? Did it get destroyed? Did it get taken back to Babylon? Is it in Ethiopia, right? Everybody claims to have it. Is it buried underneath the, the temple in Jerusalem? But I have had a theory for, I don't know, years, almost 20 years, that came to me when I was a graduate student at UCLA. Um, uh, when reading 2 Kings 18, uh, and it's parallel in Isaiah 36. Uh, and I can't shake it. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is drag poor Jordan here through this through this exercise. And I want to make a proposal about what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and it's a it, it's not a boring proposal. I think it's a I think it's a good proposal. I, you know, I, 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 again, and I admit up front, we don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody knows. So I'm not, let's just, let's just be very honest. Nobody knows what happened to this thing. Uh, and I don't have any archaeological evidence for this theory. This is a literary argument. So let's just state this up front. But I think it's an intriguing exercise. So what we want to do is walk through this exercise and make the following case that the Ark of the Covenant is gone. It no longer exists. It's not hiding somewhere. It's not in a tunnel under the temple in Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's not in Ireland, right? It's not, it's in, not in a government facility right, found by Indy. Right, right. It's not, it's not in a box, right? It's not in Ethiopia, right? It's gone. It's been destroyed. And it wasn't destroyed at the hands of the Babylonians. The Ark of the Covenant was destroyed by none other than King Hezekiah himself. And it was destroyed as part of the purge of objects, the, the religious reform done by Hezekiah as um, listed, as described in 2 Kings 18, 18 verse 4. Yeah. And so... I want to argue that it, the Ark of the Covenant was once listed there, along with the Asherah and the Bamot and the and the Nehushtan, right? And that then later somebody came along and said, "You you can't admit to destroying the Ark of the," and then they erased it, and that's the end of the Ark of the Covenant, right? But that Hezekiah actually got rid of the Ark of the Covenant because it is essentially an idol. Right, the Ark of the Covenant. What it, what is it made out it's of? It's right? slightly problematic. Yeah, it's a, a wood co wood box covered in gold. It's covered in gold with some yeah. hybrid mythological figures on top of it, right? Cherubim, and so um, Hezekiah is not only getting rid of idols, right? These aren't, these aren't foreign idols, right? Sure, an Asherah, sure, but you know these high places. They're sacred places. They're sacred places, and they're sacred places to the Hebrew God. Yeah. Some of these are objects like the Nehushtan, yep. right? And we'll look at this verse in a second. This is something that Moses made. Now, granted, it's a graven image. Granted, it's made out of bronze, but God told him to make it, right? The Israelites are wandering around in the desert, complaining about things as they are wont to do. Um, they're getting bitten by uh, poisonous snakes, snakes. And God tells them, what? You make this snake, you put it on a pole, you stick it in the middle of the camp, and if you get bitten by this poisonous snake... You need only look up at the snake and you will be healed. And apparently, according to 2 Kings 18, people were still venerating this thing that God told Moses to make. Moses himself, right, made this thing. And so people were still venerating it. So it's not like this is a foreign deity, right? The Hebrew God told Moses to make this. This is an object that came about by the order of the Hebrew God. So these aren't just foreign idols that Hezekiah is destroying. These are high places of worship. Some of these are matzibot. Some of these are standing stones, 
right? And if we look back through the Hebrew Bible, there are many standing stones that were established by the Hebrews, by the Israelites, as they come into the Holy Land, right? We know that um, Jacob sets one up mm -hmm. after he uh, wrestles down there at Jabbok, Peniel, right? Yep. If he, he wrestles with God and wins, right? Uh, you have them when they when they come into the Promised Land, right? They cross, they cross uh, the River Jordan. The Jordan separates, and then he makes this big, th and they cover it with plaster, and they put the the according to the story, they put the Torah on it. They write the covenant on it. So you have these standing stones. These were probably, if they were still standing, still venerated. And Hezekiah is not just getting rid of foreign idols, but he's also getting rid of these places that may or may not have still been worshipped by faithful Israelites, right? By faithful Judahites. Yeah. yeah. And so he says, we're not just getting rid of icons and idols to foreign gods. We're getting rid of any other object that may be attracting worship other than the temple here in Jerusalem. And that's the key. Anti-iconism, uh, the, the absolute forbidding of uh, idols, is at least part of this, of this story. Now, we can have a debate, a scholarly debate, over whether this, when, when this takes place, right? There's a lot of discussion about this whether that was much later, because we're still digging these things on the archaeological excavations. We're still digging a lot of these um, icons out of the ground. But you also have the prophetic texts that are saying, stop worshiping these idols. So it may not have, it may not have been completely abolished, right? The, the people, the Israelites, the Judahites are still practicing the worship of these idols. We, we certainly read about it, but it's not part of the official state religion. Right, you're not supposed to be doing this. The prophets are saying, "Stop doing this." It's like the no skateboarding sign, right? If you see signs that say "no skateboarding, no skateboarding, no skateboarding," it means somebody skating. Somebody's skating, right? It's still happening, right? So the fact that you have all these prophetic texts that are saying "don't skateboard" means that the people are still doing it, but it's not supposed to be happening. And Hezekiah is trying to get rid of this, and he wants all worship to be of the Hebrew God, right? And he wants it to take place at the temple in Jerusalem. So that's where we're going to pick up. My theory is that Hezekiah destroyed the Ark of the Covenant among the purge of all these other objects. Now, why do I think this? What's the evidence? To the text. Yeah, so let's look at the text. So... Now, I'm going to, we'll, we'll cut this up in the video. We'll try to edit this nicely, but we're going to jump around here to some of the texts, and this will be a text study. So I'm gonna, I, I want to, we want to try to get as many of these texts in here as possible. Jordan has found a lot of really interesting things uh, just, to, just to give you, uh, to look at, to, to think about, uh, that I think will support um, this theory. Again, this is a, this is a discussion from it's, it's a literary argument right it's a discussion from the literature but i think that because the ark of the covenant a i think it existed i think it was a real thing because it was problematic right you have a religion that bans idols and what are they doing they're marching around with a wooden box covered in gold with hybrid mythological figures on it right cherubim and it has both entered and exited the scene before hezekiah as well correct correct this, it's this, not consistently on the stage. It comes and goes. Correct. So what do we know about the Ark? What do, what, what do you want to, or, should, or should, I, should I set it up a give little him, bit more? Give them yeah. your setup so we right. can get into so, the to kings. What do we know about the Ark of the Covenant? In Exodus 25, you're going to get, they shall make an Ark of acacia wood, right? And it shall be two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. So they're going to build a box out of wood, right? This is Exodus 25, 10. Um, you're going to put some poles along the sides of it the, uh, to carry the ark, right? So in Exodus 25, you're getting the directions for how to build this, this box, right? And then in Exodus 25, 16, you shall put into the ark the covenant that I shall give you. Okay, so you're going to put a copy of the covenant. And then shall, you shall put a mercy seat. This is 25, 21, Mercy seat on top of the ark, 
And in the ark, you shall put the covenant. And it says, there I will meet with you. This is 2522. And from above the mercy seat, this is the cover, right? From between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the covenant, I will deliver to you all of my commands for the Israelites. So there is this idea that, that the box uh, made out of wood, covered in gold, with these two hybrid mythological figures, right? These two winged beings that are on top of it. Either they're touching wings like this, or they're touching wings like this, one way or the other. That, that this is basically, this cover is the footstool of God. God lives up in the sky, but his feet touch here, and he's enthroned above the cherubim. Now, the interesting thing is, if you read throughout the rest of the, the text of the Hebrew Bible, you're going to see that cherubim appear elsewhere, in the tabernacle, but also in the temple, right? So the cherubim aren't just on the uh, Ark of the Covenant, that you also get them in the linens, in the cloths, right? Exodus 26, 1 says that the curtains that formed the desert tabernacle uh, were made, quote, with cherubim skillfully worked into them right? 26, Exodus 26, 31 says that the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was made, quote, with cherubim skill, skillfully worked into them, okay? Here's what's really interesting. Um, God is always described as the Lord of hosts. This is uh, 1 Samuel 4, 4, 2 Samuel 6, 2, the Lord of hosts who was enthroned on the cherubim. Now, that could clearly be a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. He's the, he's the Lord enthroned above the cherubim. But because you also have references to the temple later on, after uh, the temple's built, 1 Kings 6.23 says that there are two identical massive cherubim crafted out of olive wood, covered in gold, again with the graven images here, that are placed in the inner sanctum, Right? 1 Kings 6.27 says the wings of the cherubim were spread out so that a wing of one was touching one wall and a wing of the other cherub was touching the other wall and the wings, uh, the other wings towards the center of the house were touching wing to wing. So apparently you also had two freestanding cherubs sitting in the inner sanctum that in between which the Ark of the Covenant sat. And of course, on the Ark of the Covenant, you had the cover and then the cherubs there. You also had, uh, 1 Kings 6.29, he carved the walls of the house all around about with engravings of cherubim, palm trees, open flowers. 1 Kings 6.32 says the doors uh, uh, that, that were going into the, to the temple, engravings, carvings of cherubim and palm trees. 1 Kings 7.29 and 36 says that cherubim were integrated into the decorations of, of other temple implements, Right and all of the, the tapestries have cherubim. So there are cherubim throughout the entire temple, including these two freestanding cherubim. And the reason that I go on and on and on about all of the cherubim that are in the tabernacle tapestries and then in the temple tapestries is this. If the Ark of the Covenant disappears and the temple now becomes the house of God, which is exactly what it is, right? It's the Beit Adonai. It's the house of the Lord, right? Then God is still enthroned above the cherubim, right? There's still all kinds of cherubim, including those two massive freestanding cherubim on the inner sanctum. God is still enthroned above the cherubim, right? So even if the Ark of the Covenant isn't in there anymore, God can still be said to be enthroned above the cherubim. There are cherubim in the walls, there are cherubim in the doors, all of the temple implements, all of the tapestries, the curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the, the holy place. He's still the God enthroned above the cherubim because the whole thing is just covered with cherubim. Many people don't realize that. I actually think that the reason that they go on and on and on about all the cherubim, you're asking yourself, why would the Israelites or the Judahites, the Israelites, want to put all of these mythological beings all over, these graven, right, these engraved mythological beings all over the temple? I think it's actually an apology for what David says um, in 2 Samuel 22. 
uh, right? When David celebrates his song of deliverance from Saul uh, in verse 11, he praises God's power by saying what? God rode on a cherub and flew, right? So if this is an early song and it's praising the power of God, it's actually talking about God riding on a cherub and flying. Well, if God's flying on a cherub, then he's going to be enthroned above a cherub, but he's flying around on one of these flying things. Well, you can create an apology for this by just making sure that wherever he's dwelling is there going are. to be, right, the there ark are. or the temple, whichever it is, is just going to be covered in cherubs. And that way, God, who's up in the sky, right, who comes down into his dwelling place, whether it be a portable uh, object like the Ark of the Covenant. So when the Israelites are nomadic, they don't have a land. The temp the Ark of the Covenant is the representation of God and it's his footstool and he's enthroned above the cherubim. But when that Ark of the Covenant goes up into the temple, the temple takes on all of the veneration, all of the worship, all of the praise, all of the holiness, right? That was once reserved for the Ark of the Covenant. Once that Ark of the Covenant is placed into the temple, once Solomon builds this temple and once it's, and again, you, we can debate whether it's actually, I'm talking about what the text says, right? According to the tradition. Once the Ark of the Covenant goes into the temple, the temple now takes on all that veneration. Okay? And what's interesting is if you go through and look at all of the references to the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible, right? So all of these references in Exodus, all of these references in Numbers, right? In Deuteronomy, all of the places where the Ark goes, when they take it into battle in Joshua, when they take it into battle in 1 Samuel, and it gets taken, right? What happens in 1 Samuel, right? They take they it into battle. It. They and, lose it. And the Philistines take it. And it doesn't go so well for the Philistines. Right, no, the Philistines take it. They put it in the temple in Dagon, right? Dagon starts falling Dagon on falls his face. over. And it goes on a little tour. Right, right. And then they're like, oh, we got to get this thing out of here because the plagues are in the mice and all that stuff. So they send it back on the cart, right? And so it comes back and then they, they get this thing back, right? After all of these things where you, you're supposed to take this thing into battle, right? They, they march with this thing into battle and they're supposed to win, right? They march around Jericho with it according to the tradition. The presence of God is there in the ark. Whenever, wherever the presence of God is, right? Moses goes to meet with, before God with the ark. Anytime you do this, that's where God is. That's where you take this thing. You make a reference to the ark. Uh, the ark uh, J Joshua 6.11, the ark of the Lord went around the city, circling it once. They came to the camp, spent the night. They do it again. They took up the ark of the Lord, right? Seven priests carrying it, blah, blah, blah. So you have all these references First Samuel, it goes away, it comes back. You have this story about them trying to take it, but uh, uh, poor Uzzah reaches out and tries to touch the ark, right? Because he thinks Doing it's Doing his tipping. job, trying to keep it he from just, hit the ground. He's trying to do something nice. Gets killed, right? You have all of these references to the Ark of the Covenant. So he's like, I don't know if I want to be too close to this thing, but I know it's powerful. So he diverts it to Obed-Edom's house, right? The Gittite. And while it's sitting at his house, right, he has these tremendous blessings. And so David's like, what do I do? I want this thing with me, but I'm terrified. So we're going to try again and we're going to stop and we're going to have a sacrifice every what, six paces. Six paces. We're going to stop and have a sacrifice. We're just going to be really, really careful. But he finally gets it up into Jerusalem. Uh, and then Solomon builds this temple, right? And it's going to be a temple for the ark. And then they have this big ceremony, right? They offer sacrifices. And once the Ark of the Covenant goes into the temple, my question is, here's the trivia question. How many references to the Ark of the Covenant are there once that Ark goes into the temple? So do your word search, right? How many references to the Ark of the Covenant are there once the Ark goes into the temple? So, and, and, and don't say Chronicles because Chronicles is just paralleling Sa Samuel and Kings, right? So Chronicles is just, if you, if you don't know, uh, First and Second Chronicles is just retelling the stories in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. So here's the answer. And this is, this is what put me on to this theory, right? After the Ark of the Covenant goes into the temple, right? They have the big ceremony and they put it in there. You have 
two canonical references to the Ark of the Covenant, right? One is in Psalm 132, verse 8, right? And this is a, basically an enthronement psalm, right? Uh, in this particular verse, rise up, O Lord, go to your resting place, you and the Ark, your might, right? It's talking about Zion. It's talking about God in Jerusalem. So there's a reference in a psalm, right? It just kind of, this is the, this is where the ark is. This is where God is. This is where it's just kind of a generic reference to the ark. Fine. And then there's Jeremiah 316. Early Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah was the one who was kind of telling the Judahites, you know, maybe we ought to make a deal with these Babylonians, right? Look at Jeremiah 316. And when you have multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, says the Lord, they shall no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, right? Literally in the Hebrew, it will no longer be upon the heart, right? Or be remembered, right? Or be missed, right? Uh, it won't be literally, it says, it won't be visited. And another one shall not be made. So apparently, according to Jeremiah, and if we look very carefully at 317, look at what it says. Why is this? Because at that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall gather unto it, right? To the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. Apparently, here in Jeremiah 317, the only other, 316, right? The only other reference to the ark after it goes into the temple. Jeremiah is kind of hinting at saying, no, Jerusalem is the holy throne of God, not the ark, right? Why? The Israelites were a nomadic people, so they needed a portable ark. That was the throne of God. But once they're a landed people, the temple is the house of God. And the ark is an idol, right? It's problematic. It's, it's the temple that takes on all the veneration, not the ark. And so over time, it, right, if, if we want to postulate that the temple is built in the 10th century, eight, 200 years later, and by the 8th century, if you're starting to set into this anti-icon stuff, now again, we have to, that's a debate, right? When does the anti-iconism, is that a post-exilic thing or is, is that already being talked about by the prophets? We, we can have that debate. But if we're not supposed to have these idols, the Ark of the Covenant becomes a big problem because it's essentially a wooden box covered in gold with mythological beings sitting on top of it. And you've got cherubim all around the temple, right? According to the text, right? That's how it's decorated. So if the temple takes on all the veneration that was once reserved for the Ark of the Covenant and we're a permanent landed people now, then you don't need the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the Ark of the Covenant becomes kind of scandalous. It becomes a problem. It's an idol. So my theory is that Jeremiah is kind of hinting that you don't need the Ark of the Covenant. This is one of only two references to the Ark after it goes into the temple. You never hear about it again. You certainly don't hear about it being hauled away uh, during it's the exile. Listed. It's not listed in any of the, the things being that are removed. hauled away, right? It's The other things are listed, but it's not. you don't have it. So if it's not being specifically mentioned in the loot, in the booty in the uh, that's being taken away by the Babylonians, then maybe the Babylonians didn't take it. My theory is it's already gone. And it would make sense for it to be listed if you're wanting to parallel it with the Samuel passage. Correct. Where it's taken away, it's a prize to be captured. Yes. It's a seat of power. Yes. It's something that the enemy recognizes as powerful and wants to take that power. You for brag themselves. about this, right? You put it in your trophy case. Yes, it would be one of the centerpieces that you bring forward as we have conquered this people group and we have the seat of their divinity. Think about what the Romans did, right? In the Arch of Titus, right? When they sacked the temple in Jerusalem and they look at that inside panel in the Arch of Titus, what do you see at the front end of that? You see the loot, the remaining loot of the temple, right? And you see the table of presents. You see the trumpets. You see the menorah, right? You see the lampstand. What you do not see is the Ark of the Covenant. Menorah. This is how you know they didn't have it. They, did, they didn't get it, right? They didn't bring it back to Rome. It was already gone. Some people say, well, it's hiding in a thing under... Okay, whatever. 
And they, they didn't even flub about bringing it back. No, they didn't pretend to. No, no, it's 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 already gone, and it's not with the Babylonians because it's already gone. And my theory is, Hezekiah got rid of it. He had no problem melting down, cutting down, destroying things that were commanded, ordered to be made by God Himself, created by Moses. Come on. The, the father of all of the, you know, the, 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 the lawgiver of Judaism made this at the command of God. And Hezekiah is like, we're going to, we're cutting this down. This is, this is out of here. We're gone. Nehushtan, gone. These Bamot, gone. These Matsebot, right? These, these, these standing stones. Jacob may have set one. I don't care. Jacob, this is Israel. This is the father, the, the 12 tribe. I don't care. It's gone. Hezekiah wanted there to be one central place for the worship of the Hebrew God. That's it. And he didn't care. So I think that Hezekiah got rid of this thing. And he, I think it was actually once listed there with the Nehushtan. But somebody came along later and went, We can't write that we got rid of this. You one. can't put, and they just erased it. And that's what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. It just got erased from history because Hezekiah had already destroyed it. And then it just, you know, it became elated, right? It just became, it was just lost to history. Now, that's my argument. That's my argument from the, the lack of references to the Ark of the Covenant. It clearly was not important based upon the lack of references in the Bible. One of the references in, in the Psalm is just a generic reference to the to Zion and the Ark and God, right? In, in a song, right? In a praise song. And the other one, Jeremiah is actually saying, yeah, you, you don't need this thing, right? You, it's, you're, you're not going to want it anymore. It's, nobody's going to remember it. It's because Jerusalem, because the temple, basically, Jerusalem is going to be the place where people remember God, not the ark. So it's very anti-ark by the time of Jeremiah. All right. So that's my argument. Now, what makes me think that it was actually in the list of Hezekiah's destruction in 2 Kings 18.4, uh, and it was erased. And he was like, that's a pretty bold claim. All right, so here's, here's the argument on that. I argue that, and I wrote this in a paper for Bill Schneiderwin at UCLA 20 years ago. Probably should have published it. So I'll do it right now, Bill. So, so get off my back. Um, here, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it <laughs> for the video. He's going to say, this isn't peer-reviewed. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. My argument is that You'll notice that this list of the things that Hezekiah cut down, destroyed, uh, is in 2 Kings 18, but is not in Isaiah 36. And for those of you who aren't familiar, 2 Kings 18 through 20 uh, and Isaiah 36 through 39 are parallel passages. Somebody copied from somebody else, right? It's, it's basically the same story. With the exception of these first, what, 13 verses for... for of second Kings, right? You have this additional narrative. And one of these narratives is second Kings 18, four. And it's talking about, uh, let's start with 18, three, 18, two, right? Uh, Hezekiah was 25 years old when he began to reign. Uh, he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His, his mother's name was Avi daughter of Zechariah, right? This is a pretty standard a template for introducing a king. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, just as his ancestor David had done, one of the very few righteous kings. And then you get this. He removed the high places, broke down the pillars, and cut down the sacred pole. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for up until those days, people of Israel had been making offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. And this is what I was just referring to, right? Um, the high places, um, the uh, the pillars, right? The standing stones, the matzebot. Of course, the sacred pole, uh, the Asherah, that could be a foreign deity. But the bronze serpent that Moses made, right? This is, the Israelites are still offering, making offerings to it. Why? Because Moses made it, because God told him to. So, and Hezekiah is like, yeah, I don't care. We're, we're chopping this stuff down. Now, why do I think, uh, this is a special list. I think that this is uh, an epigraphic inscription. And the reason I think that is that this doesn't follow the standard uh, VSO Hebrew. And by that, I mean standard biblical Hebrew is written 
like most other Semitic languages, uh, with a verb, subject, object. And the only time you put the subject in front, uh, and there are some language scholars who, who disagree with this, but the overwhelming majority of, of Hebrew scholars will tell you that when you put the subject in front of the object in, in Semitic language, you're putting emphasis on uh, the subject. So I did this, or it's going to be a subordinate clause or something like that. But the other place that you see it is in epigraphic inscriptions. Okay. And here you actually see this in 2 Kings 18, who hesir et habamot, right? He removed the high places, right? And he broke down the matzebot, right? And he cut down the um, the asherah, right? So you actually have this language that appears to be taken from uh, an epigraphic inscription. And the reason that I argue that is, if I go back to the paper I wrote uh, a, a while back, if you look at the Meshastale, right? If you look at the Moabite stone, um, it actually talks about, I built um, Kaho, right? I, I, I cut the moat, right? Uh, line 26 says, I made the road in Arnon. Line 27 says, I built Bet Bamot. Right, you actually have the, the anok, right? The 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 subject coming before the verb, which is atypical. So the the place that you see uh, the subject verb object order is in these epigraphic inscriptions, right? Where kings are bragging about the things that they did, and that's what you see here in the Second Kings passage but not in the Isaiah 36 passage. So I think what's going on here is this is actually an epigraphic inscription from Hezekiah that we don't have, obviously it's lost, but that was copied in, right? He did this, he did this, he did this. I will also point out that you see this elsewhere in the Bible, right? Um, uh, 2 Kings 14, 7, he, this is Amaziah, destroyed uh, Edom. 2 Kings 14, 22, Azariah, he built Elat, right, and restored it to Judah. 2 Kings 14, 25, he, this is Jeroboam, restored the bounties of Israel, right? So I think what they're doing is when they're talking about kings, when they're bragging about them, they, they're, they're either mimicking or they're actually taking these monumental inscriptions, they're pulling a line from it, and they're changing the first person pronoun to a third person pronoun, and they're saying, he did this. He did that, but they're leaving it sounding like these monumental inscriptions, probably because this is the language of evidence of what these guys did. It's not the standard biblical Hebrew with the verb first. This is a record of the kings, and so they put the subject first. Okay, so that's my argument for why this particular passage is probably a little more authentic. Again, this is a literary argument. We don't have the evidence for this. I think you may have had an epigraphic inscription where Hezekiah is just talking about all of the religious shrines that were commanded by God to be created by these earlier peoples that are now problematic. So the Nehushtan is in a graven image, right? A bronze image. And I think he would have seen the Ark of the Covenant as a, as a graven image. You certainly don't need it anymore. You have the temple. There's a consolidation of the divine presence. Correct. The, and, it's, and it's in Jerusalem in the temple. And God is still enthroned above the cherubim. You've still got those freestanding cherubs in there. It's still in all of the tapestries, right? It's still in all the doors. It's He's still enthroned above the cherubs. The epithet remains without the problematic item. Correct. You've, you've solved a bunch of problems, according in Hezekiah's mind. And again, he doesn't mind tearing down these, these problematic things that were commanded by God to be created by Moses, right? So that's my theory. Now, why is this theory wrong? Every good scholar should ask, not just what's the evidence for my stuff, but why am I wrong? So Jordan is here. You're asking, why is Jordan here? Is Why am I wrong? What, what are some of the other pieces of evidence that we might have that would argue either against or maybe for, right? What, why am I wrong? Well, on the one hand, there's the question of if it's such a prestigious piece, does disappearing into the ether present a compelling narrative argument okay. for its disappearance? 
maybe not. Maybe maybe it's maybe it's not the way for this thing to go. We need to give it more respect. There needs to be an explanation. So some lean on that and saying it must have been taken away by some group, but they don't want to attribute it to someone. However, if we look just the next chapter, Second Kings nineteen. Okay. If we look towards the siege of Sennacherib, I think we have an interesting moment to maybe corroborate your argument. Well, I like this, but as Sennacherib go on, go comes on. forward, <laughs> Sennacherib comes forward. There's the siege of the city. There's the insults, there's the slanders, this is what I'm going to do to you, don't trust in Hezekiah, all that he's told you. And in this process, Hezekiah goes forward to the divine presence okay. to petition. Right. And I think that this is a moment that strengthens your case. It doesn't argue against your case, this moment strengthens your case right. because Hezekiah comes forward, lays out, here are the insults that they have made to you in the presence of the Lord. And in this moment, for me, I read this and go, this is a battle narrative. You're okay. being besieged. Okay. You're being attacked. All right. What is the thing, if I am an Israelite king, what's my super weapon that I want to appeal to? Yeah, of course. The Ark of the Covenant. Okay, makes sense. However, if we're looking at 2 Kings 19 and what does Hezekiah appeal to, the Ark of the Covenant doesn't come up. So, so the, the Rav Shek is out there. He's making all these things. You're going to eat your own poo and drink your own pee and... And he gives him the the surrender letter, right? The, yes. And he and the, the Eliakim and these guys, Shabna, they take the letter. They take, and they the take letter it to the Hezekiah. King. In Second Kings nineteen fourteen, Hezekiah received the letter right. from the hand of the messenger and read it. Then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Okay. Okay. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, O oh, the Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim. Right. You are the God alone of all the kingdom of all the earth. You made heaven and earth. Right, 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 right. And you on see, and, on. and he continues. Right, on. right, right. We get the re reference there to the cherubim. Right, but that's he's, is this the cherubim of the ark, or right. is this the cherubim that are placed within the temple? And he's always referred to as the. He's referred to as. My question is, if you are the king that's being besieged, right? What might be the thing you want to come to? Yeah, you're going to take this thing. I mean, you could argue that he can't go into the Holy of Holies, right? He may not be able to go in. And it doesn't mention the altar either. Usually you go grab the horns of the altar, you lay it out on the, it doesn't mention the altar. He just takes it to the house of the Lord, which is exactly what Jeremiah would say later, right? Later, this is the thing that is going to. The house of the Lord is the thing that has the power, not the ark. I want to read it again, just to make sure that we're all clear, right? Jeremiah 3.16 says, and when you've multiplied and increased in the land in those days, they shall no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It shall, it shall not come to mind or be remembered or be missed. And uh, nor shall another one be made. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall, gathered unto, shall be gathered unto it. No more Ark. And you're saying, you're suggesting what? That Hezekiah in his moment of most desperate need is why can he not appeal to the, the arc, super weapon the super weapon if as, we they, look, as they used to do as they would as they are wont to do if we go back to that first samuel 4 passage as well where where the israelites lose the ark of the covenant first samuel 4 if we jump back to first samuel 4 and this is where the israelites are wanting to go out into battle against the philistines the philistines have drawn up their battle lines First Samuel 4, 3, when the yeah. troops came to the camp, the elders of the Lord said, why has the Lord put us to rout today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, so that he may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Right. We're in distress, what do we do? We yeah, appeal to the Ark. Yeah. Verse four, so the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim. The two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, we're there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So there's some interesting, we're both in moments of conflict, right. we're being besieged. <clears throat> we appeal to the Lord, and specifically, what do we appeal to as this military might? Yeah. What's the symbol of the military might here? What do we bring forward to bring the Lord into battle with us? Right. The Ark of the Lord. It's the same thing in Numbers 10 when Moses is speaking about the Ark. Mm. Numbers 10, 35. Whenever the ark set out, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered and your foes flee before you. 
And wherever it came to rest, he would say, return, O Lord, of the ten thousand thousands of Israel. Moses is referring to this ark of the Lord as we're setting out into conflict. Let's scatter the enemies of the Lord. For Samuel 4, the people are people are aware of this tradition. What do they do? Let's appeal to the Ark of the Covenant. That is the thing that Moses would send out before us to scatter our enemies. And 1 Samuel 4, it doesn't work. Huh. And the Philistines take it, but it comes back to them. So maybe this is a moment of push against or yeah. push for. Is Hezekiah not appealing to the Ark of the Covenant in remembrance of 1 Samuel 4 and saying, the Ark will not work for me? Right. Or is he not appealing to the Ark because he's destroyed the ark. Right, it's already gone. It's already gone, and so the Lord is there. He's in the house of the Lord. The Lord is on the cherubim, but they are either the ones on the on the temple floor, the large ones standing over the ark. They're just the idea of the Lord being surrounded and enthroned on the cherubim like in Ezekiel. Right. But it's ambiguous. But this seems like a moment where this king righteous king right what do i appeal to for my divine power to help defend me and the city of god i never mentioned the ark does not mention the ark you have you have the if if you have the super neither weapon. does isaiah right right isaiah right. 37 as well it's in its similar description here right. it makes reference to the lord of hosts god of israel who are enthroned above the cherubim right no that's, that's a standard that's becoming that's a the standard, standard that right yes. that's the that's a standard this is who god is but it's no ark. It's yeah, no ark. Not the ark. You know what I find interesting is in 2 Kings 19, the, the response comes from Isaiah, right? It's, it, mm -hmm. Response comes from the court prophet, right? From Hezekiah's prophet. So it's it's he goes in before the Lord, not before the ark, but before the Lord. And the response is now coming from the prophet. They used to, uh, you know, I was going to say wheel, but they used to pull out this ark, right? If they needed help. But now they're going before the Lord and basically praying, and the response comes not with an ark going out, you know, and we're going to go into battle against you guys because we have the ark. The response comes from, uh, this is 2 Kings 19.20, uh, Then Isaiah, son of Amos, uh, sent to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, I have heard your prayer about King Sennacherib. This is what the Lord has spoken concerning him. Uh, she despises you, she scorns you, virgin daughter, blah, 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 and it goes on. Why have you mocked me? And he, and he gives on this, this long uh, response in, in the form of a prophecy, but basically says that they're going to be delivered. Basically, you're going to be fine. You're going to be growing your own crops. Assyria is not going to take you over. Uh, and therefore, what happens? That very night, the angel of the Lord set out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the morning dawned, they were all dead bodies. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria left, went home, and lived at Nineveh. And remember, we have we have corroboration, not of this happening here, but of Sennacherib having to go back to Nineveh because there was a coup back Some home. Some political infighting. Correct, correct going back home. So what we do know is that Sennacherib never conquered Jerusalem. Hezekiah actually survived uh, the siege of Jerusalem. Now, we have evidence that he paid him off. Right, because we have we actually have that in Second Kings eighteen at the beginning of it, that he paid him off. We have two stories, right? But Sennacherib didn't destroy Jerusalem; he got out of it. Uh, and as he's worshiping his house, he gets killed, right? So, but what you don't see as the deliverance is bring the ark out and do this. Is what happens now? By this time, is you go to the before the Lord. And it's coming in the form of a prayer and a messenger of the Lord angel. The system is completely different by the 8th century. You don't have any references to the Ark. And this is well before the Babylonians come and supposedly just, you know, take the Ark and when, they, when they're destroying the city. I think another interesting thing to consider as we read this passage of him coming before the Lord enthroned above the cherubim is the way he discusses this appeal for divine protection, but brings in an interesting praise, might we call it, for the attackers and their destruction of the other gods of the surrounding nations. In 2 Kings 19, if we're looking down right in verse 14, he gets the message. In verse 15, he goes before the Lord and thrown above the cherubim, asks the Lord to hear 
And then in verse 18, this description of some of what the Assyrians have been doing, they've hurled their gods, the gods of the surrounding nations, into the fire. Though they were no gods, but the work of human hands, wood and stone, and so they were destroyed. This insert here is an interesting parallel with what Hezekiah does in 2 Kings 18 with his religious reforms, right? In 2 Kings 18.4, he tears down the high places, he breaks the pillars, cuts down the sacred pole, then Hushtan. These things, the destruction of idols, might we call them, places of worship, is something that Hezekiah does as a sign of good religious reform. But now in 2 Kings 19, it's something that the Assyrians are also doing. So he's giving this odd praise to the Assyrians here before then returning to his request. So now, O oh Lord, save us, I pray you, from his hand. It's not an appeal to the ark because just like Hezekiah destroyed those idols, those man-made items, so the Assyrians have been destroying those things in other places because they were not effective means of defending those other places. If Hezekiah here is coming to the Lord, would it make sense in this text, in light of the reforms of 18, and in light of praising the Assyrians, destroying the idols of the surrounding nations that were not effective means of defense, does it make sense for Hezekiah to come to the ark for defense then? I think that it doesn't. So if Hezekiah was to come before the ark to make a request here, it'll be odd in maybe a couple ways because he's appealing to something that goes against some of his reforms. He's appealing to something that is like the things that weren't effective for the other nations. It's an interesting addition to consider when we're thinking about what are the cherubim? Where are these cherubim? What ones might these be? Maybe this is another thing to consider. These aren't the cherubim that are on the ark. Maybe these are the cherubim that are in the tapestries surrounding, somehow included into this place, but not the cherubims of the ark themselves. So that's the argument. The I mean, again, I'm the first one to admit there's no archaeological evidence for it. I do think the ark existed because it was a problem. Uh, and we don't have any evidence of the Babylonians hauling it off to Babylon. So maybe it was just burned in the fire. Uh, but we don't have any record of it existing after it gets put into the temple, right? We have two references to it, and Jeremiah's is very negative. There's, you're not going to be talking about it anymore. And you have a, a psalm, just kind of a generic psalm talking about the ark, you know, the, the Jerusalem being the place where God is and uh, and then depending on how you date Psalm 132. It, the fact that there's no reference to the ark and the fact that in a time of crisis, I think you're right, by the way. Thank you. I, I, I love that that take on, I have spent all my time looking at Psalm, uh, at 2 Kings 18. Yeah, I didn't even think to look at 2 Kings 19. When they're actually bringing the letter, they don't take it to the ark. And the, the, the deliverance doesn't come from the ark. It comes and even from, if they're not appealing before the ark, there's no attempt to muster the right. ark to let me appeal first so that we may proceed and bring the ark out right. to defend us. Right. They're, and the I think, means of defense has And changed. I think this is because it's the temple now. The yeah. temple is now the house of God, and it's no longer the ark. Um, but I think this is because Hezekiah has done away with it. And, and that I, some good, some good scribe later on just said, "What the heck? You can't, you can't say that you destroyed this thing." They were okay with the Nehushtan. That, that was can go away. Fine, yeah, but they, the ark was too central. There was too much ink spilled in Exodus. When I think the defense too, if we're looking at what gets defended, right? It's it's the city that gets defended, which also lines up with Jeremiah three. Of it's not just the house, but it's at that time, Jerusalem oh, shall yeah, be yeah, called. Yeah. So it's, where is the seat? The seat is no longer just the ark. The seat is the temple. Yeah. And then the expanse of the temple spreads out to that city. So it's in centralizing it. It's not just the temple yeah, yeah, that's yeah. of importance. The whole city here, is saved. The city. And so Jeremiah says in Jerusalem, at that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. Isaiah 37, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, yeah. which is the same thing that happens in 2 Kings, for I will to say, defend this city. Yeah. So it's moved away from the centrality of the ark. Yeah. The problematic thing, it got put into the temple, we're able to forget about it. 
I think Jeremiah's right. right. We're not going right. to remember it anymore. Right. And so we're able to take it away. But right. it's not like the Nehushtan. We can't talk about breaking it up. It's a little too sensitive. Right. It's a little too important. We carried that around in the wilderness for what? Right. If we're just mm -hmm. going to tear it apart now, right. we right. carried right. it around for what? Right. So it needs to slip into the ether. It's, it's it just, important. It just, we it can't just, just... Fades into the memory. We can't talk about destroying it, but... I like that. I, I I like that. It just it just needs to go away quietly, and that's what it did. The Ark of the Covenant. So I mean, that doesn't make for a good movie, right? But it just needs to go away quietly, and I think that's what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. It just went away. But I think the answer to the question is the answer to the riddle. Man, it's a boring answer. It doesn't make for good documentaries and Spielberg movies, both of which I love and like to participate in. But uh, it it just went away quietly. It was such a problem. They just made it go away quietly. That's your answer. That's what I think. What do you think? Um, let us know in the comments below. Thank you, Jordan. That was that was excellent. I I had never considered um, failing to bring out the super weapon. <laughs> you got this thing. Why why aren't you why aren't you using it? And it's and it's sitting right there, not being used. Unless it's not. Unless it's not sitting. Unless it's oh, not. Thank you. I like it when. I always like it when people agree with me. Um, usually Jordan disagrees with me. He, he, my first question is always, why am I wrong? And he's like, well, let me count the ways for they are legion. But <laughs> um, if you have an idea or a thought about what happened to the Ark of the Covenant, leave it in the comments below. That'll do it for this episode of the Tower of Bible podcast. Unless you have anything else. I got nothing to add. <laughs> right. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell if you want to be made aware of future videos like this one. But for everyone here at the Tower of Bible Podcast, I'm Dr. Bob Cargill, the excavator, wishing you everything the best.